There we go. So let's talk about anatomy and physiology. As we look at this class, there's two key components to A&P. Anatomy is the study of the structures. Physiology is the study of function. And as we look at these two things, they are two sides of the same coin. The structure of a body part determines what we use that body part for. The function of that body part determines what its structure needs to be. This is a unifying theme. This is the single most important idea in the entire class, which is why it's the very first PowerPoint slide in the entire class. Structure determined function. So as we look at a hammer, hammers do a really good job of putting nails in wood. Hammers make terrible screwdrivers. And conversely, screwdrivers function really well to apply torque or a twisting force to a screw. That's what their structure is optimized for. But a hammer makes a lousy, excuse me, a screwdriver makes a lousy hammer. So as we look at the human body, there are different ways that we, as aspiring healthcare professionals, can learn more about the human body. For instance, you can look at it. And there's a fancy word for looking at it. That is inspection. We can also feel for a medical purpose. So when we palpate something, we are feeling for a medical purpose. There's different ways to feel people. Palpation implies that you're look, trying to gain information for a healthcare purpose. Um, another feeling word is fondle. Fondle implies feeling for sexual arousal for a sexual purpose. And generally speaking, you don't want to do that as a healthcare provider to your patients. We palpate our patients instead. Now, another way we can learn more about our patients or future patients is to listen to them with a the stethoscope. That's called osculation. And I, I need to clarify here. <coughs> when we osculate, it's typically with the stethoscope. This doesn't mean talking to the patient. It's not that kind of listening. It's putting the stethoscope on their body and listening to the inside of their body. And hand in hand with listening to their body or osculating them, a lot of times we'll hit them to see what kind of sounds they make. And usually that's where the physician will put the stethoscope on the body torso and they'll go tap, 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 and tap it with their fingers. Or every once in a while they have the little rubber hammer and they'll tap the body with the rubber hammer just to see what it sounds like. Other ways we can learn about human beings is to cut up human beings. It's called cadaver dissection. When I started teaching anatomy and physiology at a post-secondary setting, um, I taught with cadavers for my students. We had a male and a female cadaver in submersion tanks, and it was great, a wonderful learning tool uh, for our students. Another way you can learn a and is doing comparative dissections, and we're in the process of phasing that in right now. Um, a lot of times you, learn, you cut up other species, pigs or monkeys or rabbits, to learn what their organs look like, so you can learn more about what human organs look like. You can also learn more about the human being by doing exploratory surgery. Um, thankfully, exploratory surgery has become a lot more, or I should say a lot less invasive. Traditionally, it's been taking a scalpel, making a large incision, peeling the body cavity opening, and then looking around on the inside. And it's been fairly traumatic. There was a lot of soft tissue injury associated with that. Uh, now when we do exploratory surgery, it's usually with an endoscope. So it would be a little tiny incision and a long probe will be inserted into the body cavity. As we're doing imaging on the human body, um, we are going to be performing radiography or we'll be generating radiographs as we look at the inside of the human body without actually making an incision to the human body. And during radiography, uh, or generating radiographs, we have different ways of generating those radiographs. Um, for instance, we can hit a patient with x-rays. X-rays do a great job of showing dense, bony structures. X-rays don't do a good job of showing soft tissue distinctions in the human body. So for example, my wife dislocated her shoulder two weeks ago, or a week ago, and she had an x-ray done we know there are no broken bones, but she still has a lot of pain. We assume at this point there's probably some soft tissue damage, and she's going in for an MRI Wednesday morning. Um, when we look at 
radiography or x-rays. They're fairly cheap, they're fairly affordable. Um, so it's usually the go-to, the first image that's taken. We also can inject a patient with radiographic substances. And these radiographic or radioplaque substances are usually a special kind of glucose with a radioactive barium isotope inserted in it. So when the patient is drinking radioactive sugar, the parts of their body that sugar goes to will glow in the radiograph. And these are particularly useful for identifying parts of the body with high metabolism. Um, so if we think of cancers, radiographic imaging is a way to make cancerous tumors light up on the human body because cancers have a very high metabolic rate because of all the cell division occurring in those cancerous tumors. We could take lots and lots and lots of x-rays, and that's called a CT scan, or computed, computed tomography scan. And this is um, going to be a lot of low-intensity x-rays taken in slices that we can use to stack on top of each other and view the inside of the human body. We also can use MRIs, <coughs> magnetic resonance imaging. For those of you who have a chemistry background, this is also known as nuclear magnetic resonance, MNRs as well, same technology. So the idea behind an MRI is you take a ridiculously strong magnetic field and you blast the patient with many Henrys of magnetism. And that makes all the electrons point in the same direction and then all those electrons in the human body, when you turn the magnet off, will go poop and pop. So they spin in opposite spin states. Think of the Pauli exclusion principle, for those of you who like chemistry. So we make electrons in the human's body wiggle around with magnets. And when these electrons wiggle around, they give off radio waves. Those radio waves are picked up and interpreted and used to visualize soft tissue in the human body. Um, a contraindication or a big reason why we don't perform an MRI on a patient is if they have any kind of magnetic substance in their body. Maybe they're an iron worker and they have metal fragments in their body from welding, or maybe they have a, mag a really old prosthesis that's magnetic. Those really strong magnetic waves that generate the signal will take that magnetic substance in their body and wiggle it around at high speed and liquefy them from the inside out. So, iron, like having iron workers and MRIs, generally speaking, don't work, go hand in hand with each other. Um, really old tattoos um, that have black or that blue-black ink um, in geriatric patients, sometimes it has a lot of iron in them, and you can actually see the tattoo ink get pulled across their skin after the MRI has been performed. We also can do a PET scan. The PET scan is um, the, a form of that contrast imagery where we give the patient something that is radioactive, a radioactive sugar, and we can look at the metabolic state of tissues. Um, one that's had a lot of adva advances over the last 20 years is sonography, also known as ultrasounds. And when we think of an ultrasound, um, I think back to when my mother was pregnant with my youngest brother. The ultrasound of my youngest brother was this grainy, fuzzy, not very well made out image. But when my wife was pregnant and we went in, they, they called them 4D ultrasounds. The idea is that you have very high resolution ultrasounds that are performed and you can make out facial features or lots of structural characteristics of whatever it is you're scanning can be made out in real time. The nice thing about sonography is that these radio waves don't alter the genome in any way. You aren't introducing any kind of a carcinogen either with radiation or by ingesting isotopes in the body. The bad thing about sonography is that the resolution isn't quite the same. So if we look at MRIs and CAT scans and contrast imagery, you get really great detail, but it takes longer and there's a potential for genome mutation. So let's talk about broad fields of anatomy and physiology. We have gross anatomy. For those of you who are planning on going to professional school or graduate school, most of you will take a gross anatomy class your very first semester. And you'll be assigned your own cadaver and you'll cut up your own cadaver. The idea behind gross anatomy is that you look at the stuff that's big enough to see 
with your naked eye. If you can see it unaided, it's big or gross. So when we say gross here, we don't mean icky or yucky. We mean big, so the big anatomy. We also can spend time on a microscope looking at structures. The study of tissues is known as histology. Histo is a prefix. You can go ahead and circle histo in your notes. Let me click that again. Here we go. Histo means tissue. Ology means the study of. Histology is the study of tissues. And we will be doing a lot of histology in lab. We also have cytology, cyto meaning cell. And we'll be doing a little bit of that. We're going to camp on this slide for a little bit. This is the hierarchy of life. And I intentionally didn't leave any blanks on it because I want you just to focus on listening and writing notes in the margin. So while we're looking at the hierarchy of life, we'll start from the bottom and work our way up. We're going to start off with an atom. And we're not going to talk about subatomic particles or the quarks or the muons. We're just going to say atoms and leave it at that. This isn't a particle physics class. So if we take lots of atoms and combine them together, two or more atoms working together, we can make a molecule. And then if we take multiple molecules and have them working together, we can make an organelle. So we can take those atoms, combine them to make molecules. Those molecules can then make an organelle. And then if we take multiple organelles and combine them, so they're working together for a similar purpose. So the way we define, say it is two or more organelles working together for a common purpose. So if we have multiple organelles working together, we'll make a cell. And I want you to put a big fat star next to cells. This is an important distinction. A cell is the smallest living thing. If it's smaller than a cell, it's not alive. So when we think of the cell, another way of thinking of a cell is a cell is the structural and functional unit of life. We are made of lots of cells, lots of little living things working together. And as we take cells, we can take multiple cell types and have them work together to make a tissue. If we take multiple tissues and have them work together, it can make an organ. Multiple organs working together can make an organ system. So when we think of organs, they can include the brain, the heart, the liver, the spleen. You know, you probably, most of you have probably heard of those organs already. And then we have organ systems. That's like the reproductive system, the digestive system, the integumentary system. And if we take all those organ systems and combine them, we get an organism at the end, which is the part most of you care about. Now, as we look at human beings, guys, gals, I need to emphasize this. We're all different. And the differences in human beings is what makes anatomy and physiology so exciting. Just like we have differences on the outside. Some of us have dark skin. Some of us have fair skin. Some of us have different eye colors. Some are short. Some are tall. Those differences on the inside continue on the inside. Some people have their arteries and veins oriented differently from the person next to them. And from person to person to person, there's going to be lots of little variations. Um, if you go on to graduate school, you'll get to learn about what percentage of the population looks like this on the inside, what percentage of the population looks like that on the inside. Um, at this level, at the undergraduate level, we're just going to teach you the most common way it looks on the inside. that will apply to the most possible people. Um, I emphasize that we as humans are different because our teaching models are different. In lab, from model to model to model, we have little differences and variations in our teaching models. When you look at the diagrams in your lab manual, they're going to look a little different from your teaching models. And this is an important skill that you're going to need to develop. You need to be able to look at a diagram and convert what's on the diagram and figure out what you're looking at on this teaching model that's in front of you. Model A, we'll say. And then you need to be able to go over to model B and figure out the same structures on that other model. And this is going to be good preparation for you as future healthcare providers. You need to know what you're looking at, even though it doesn't look exactly the same as whatever it is that you were studying from. Some individuals are really, really different looking. 
Um, if they have sitches inversus, they have the left and right flip-flop of their internal organs. And generally speaking, speaking, that only is noticed when there's some kind of a surgery, some kind of imaging performed. Most people that have sitches inversus don't even know that their organs are flip-flopped in their bodies, in their torsos. There's also going to be variations in the aorta. So the one that we teach you in lab is this variation. But you will see all kinds of differences when you go into healthcare. So I want to emphasize this. The differences you see in lab and the teaching models are good. They help to prepare you for the differences you're going to see in the real world. So we talked about how to organize life. Let's talk about how the characteristics of life. To be considered living, you need to have all of these things represented in what you're looking at. Um, a lot of high school biology teachers will spend a lot of time talking about this and have the students look at flames or crystals, and you know, things that can reproduce or grow or that can feed but aren't necessarily alive. We as human beings meet all of the criteria. We are organized. We have membranes in our bodies that compartmentalize different fluid cavities with different kinds of chemistry. We have cells in our body, and these cells are always going to be the smallest unit of life. These cells also have organization within them. We have metabolism. And when we think of metabolism, I'm not referring to how quickly we burn through our calories. I'm talking about all chemical reactions in our bodies, whether we're breaking something down or building something up. If it's a chemical reaction in your body, it's part of your metabolism. We also have responsiveness. We can respond to the environment. If you're cold, you can walk inside. If you're thirsty, you can take a drink. You have a, the ability to make changes based on the feedback, the information you're being fed. Um, we as animals can respond pretty quickly. Other organisms like plants, they can't respond very quickly. So responsiveness can be fast or it can be slow. As long as there's some kind of a response over time, that's responsiveness. And then finally, we have movement. We as animals can move very quickly. We have muscles that contract to move our skeleton and our whole organism. Um, but we can also move through growth as well. When we think of plants, there's phototropisms, there's gravitropisms. They can grow towards the light or away from the light. Uh, so even plants have movement. Something else we have is homeostasis. And this is the second really big concept of today's class. Concept number one is that anatomy is the study of, anatomy and physiology is the study of structure and function. Concept number two is that we need to remain constant on the inside. We need to maintain homeostasis or a relatively constant internal environment. If our body becomes too cold or too hot or too sugary or too acidic on the inside, we die. We need to stay the same on the inside. We need to maintain homeostasis. So homeo meaning the same, stasis referring to unchanging or static. Homeostasis is going to be maintaining that internal environment. We also have development. We can grow. We can change. We are not the same today as we were yesterday, and we won't be the same tomorrow as we are today. We can reproduce. We are capable of making copies of ourselves as human beings. And then finally, um, at a population level, our genes will go from one generation to the next generation. So there's that genetic information being passed on so that natural selection can take an effect or have a chance to act on us as a population level for the potential of evolution. Let's pause for just a second here. All right. Let's go back. I want to check the time. So uh, something else that happens to us as we change over time is, you know, things, you know, don't look the same. You don't look the same right now as you did when you were in preschool. And you won't look the same when you're 90 years old. The term that we use for this degeneration of tissues as we age is called sense senescence. 
So as we look at senescence, this is going to be the degradation or the shutting down of our body systems. Right now, you're at about peak operation, generally speaking. Most young ladies will peak physically at about 22 to 25. Most young men will peak physically at about 25 to 29, 27. Um, and then there's a very steady plateau. And then typically at about the age of 60, things start to go down pretty quickly at that stage. Um, at least according to my dad, it was 50 or 55. But you know, as we get older, things start wor stop working at an accelerating rate. So aging and sentience are two distinctions I want to make. Aging is just the changes that occur over time. When you age from a three-year-old to a four-year-old, you actually have an enhancement of tissues. You have more features and more options in your body. So aging isn't necessarily bad. Sentience, though, is going to be the loss of function over time. So this is a big deal. Right now in the United States, one in nine Americans is 65 or older. It's a big part of American healthcare. And this, you're the baby boomers. We had this giant bubble in our population. And now that giant bubble in our population is at approaching or entering or in the geriatric stage of life or the golden years of life. Um, something that's also going to be very important about this is that we don't have as many young people anymore. Um, the pop birth rate in the United States has been below replacement levels for quite some time. Um, right now, for millennials, we're looking at about 1.7-ish babies per woman. And to maintain a level population, you need two babies per mom. Um, so we are actually having fewer young people to take care of more old people. And there's going to be a lot of economic disruptions associated with that. We're going to have to restructure our, our economy associated with that. As we look at these individuals that are 65 or older, they have lots of disease. You know, as you get older, things don't work as well. And as Americans, we have lots of lifestyle disease. And I say lifestyle disease because these are diseases that correlate to how you choose to live your life. Cardiovascular function, uh, diabetes, particularly the type 2 diabetes. When we think of loss of bone density and loss of muscular strength, these are all associated with your lifestyle, how you choose to live your life. What makes us get older? is unclear. There are a lot of competing theories. Um, the fact that we get older and die is kind of puzzling and baffling to a lot of individuals because we have the ability to make new cells, we can regenerate tissues, we can maintain a germline, and if we think about it, an older person can give birth to a newborn baby. We have the ability to generate brand new, really young tissues from our bodies at a metabolic level. Um, so why we get old and die is kind of puzzling because we have the ability to maintain indefinitely. Um, as we look at our organ systems that are getting older, or, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, personal health and fitness are big issues, are big factors that determine sentience. If you live a healthy lifestyle, you will have more functionality and less sentient senescence as you get older. When one organ system starts to shut down, that will cause other organ systems to not work as well. For instance, when people's joints start to hurt, they stop running. And when they stop running, their cardiovascular system doesn't work as well. And when their cardiovascular system doesn't work as well, everything else starts to um, shut down. For instance, if your heart isn't working as well, you have less blood going to your brain, and then your nervous system isn't working as well. One malfunction will lead to another malfunction. What typically happens is they start to pile on top of each other and to accumulate until you're at the end of life and lots of organ systems are malfunctioning at the same time. So, for those of you who are wondering, what could I do? You can eat right and get moderate exercise. General guidelines involve eating mostly plants, a little meat every day. So mostly plants and a little bit of meat, just kind of general guideline in terms of healthy eating. Um, use moderation and then exercise 40 minutes a day or um, for 40 minutes, three times a week. Um, there have been a lot of really cool studies about geriatric individuals. Um, even if you've never lifted weights in your life, it's not too late to start. Um, individuals that are well past retirement age can lift weights and become stronger. 
You can increase muscle strength, you can increase bone density. The best day to start is right now for increasing those things in your life. Um, when we think of resistance exercises, those are exercises that typically involve, well, resistance or weights or um, exercise bands, something that you have to push your muscles hard against. They do a great job of increasing bone density. Endurance exercises are going to make your cardiovascular system perform much better. And a good workout routine will involve a little resistance and a little cardio. Um, in the United States, for the last four years, life expectancy, or the average lifespan of uh, average American, has gone down um, four out of the last five years. Um, reasons for life expectancy in the United States going down all can be linked back to lifestyle diseases and or diseases of despair. Um, drug overdoses, suicides, or binge eating hamburgers until you die of type 2 diabetes. Um, just two weeks ago, the new data came out for this year. Life expectancy in the United States went up a month. Um, so we reversed the trend. We had a little increase or uptick of life expectancy in the United States two weeks ago. Um, generally speaking, boys born today in the United States live about 76-ish years on average. Women or a girl born today will live for about 81 years-ish on average. So generally speaking, women live longer than men. Just go visit a nursing home. There's way more ladies in a nursing home than there are old men. And in terms of lifespan, the maximum age that a human being can live, the oldest documented human is 122 years old. And this hasn't, got, this hasn't increased for a very long time. I want to say in the United States, the oldest currently living American is 114 years old. Don't quote me on that. Um, getting beyond that century mark is a pretty cool accomplishment, but nobody has made it past 122. So, how about death? What happens when we die? You know, it's really hard to define death. I mean, it's one of those things, we all know what it is, but how do we describe it? You know, things just stop working. But some things in our bodies cannot work, and we can still be alive. People that have an appendage amputated don't die, even though their leg stops working. So how we define death, you know, is, is kind of semantic or pedantic. Some organs are going to keep working for a really long time after our heart stops pumping. Other organs, you know, shut down right away after our heart stops pumping. Um, so when we think of brain death, how do we define brain death? We have a flat EEG. No electrical activity in the brain is brain death. And if we think of this electrical activity of the brain being gone, we're also going to lose some of our reflexes, which are governed by our spinal cord. We're going to lose respiration, so not breathing. Some people will have brain death after not breathing for as little as 30 minutes. Other people can go as long as 24 hours without breathing. Um, and this is one of those things where it, you know, it depends on the situation. We've all heard stories about little children who fell through the ice in the middle of winter, and they're at the bottom of a really cold lake for a couple hours. They got pulled up, given CPR, and they were totally fine. They were resuscitated. They were great. And then we also hear stories about people who were choking on some food in a restaurant, and in five minutes, they kicked the bucket. So there's a lot of variability with this time frame. So when we think of death, it's usually a cascade of organ failures. When we have multiple organ systems shutting down at the same time, that's death. So, for the record, this is a participation-only review question, and this is our practice day for Top Hat. Please pull out either your cell phones, or if you're following along on computers on the Top Hat website, we have a matching question. Please drag and drop. Um, we have study of function, study of structure. We have two definitions and two words. Drag and drop, and then when you're done, hit submit. I'm going to start our 60-second timer. So we have 60 seconds to drag and drop. And then you can hit submit. It looks like we're about a quarter of the way done as a class. Most of you are about done submitting. Today, I'm, don't worry about it. Yeah. I assume there's going to be a lot of people who are having issues today. So it's not going to count against you. Uh, talk to me after class.
We're down to 10 seconds. And guys, gals, just as a heads up, these in-class review questions are not meant to be stressful. If you don't know the answer, that's okay. Answer anyways. I'm recording your participation, not your correctness. So as long as you answer, you get your participation point. And we're done. Let's look at our responses. Oh. Uh, yes. So, apparently, Ms. Laundress just forwarded a concern to me. Um, when we say drag and drop, with the right-handed column over here, you click on A or B and you drag it up and down for the drag and drop. Was anyone having an issue with that? Okay. Question, comment. All right. Let's, you know what? Let's just try again. So let's see here. I'm going to click close. Uh, and let's see if I can reset. There we go. I reset it. So we have your responses on the right-hand side. Drag them up and down if you want to modify your answers. And then you can hit submit. All right, let's move on. So, and again, today's the practice day. So in terms of correct answers, we did pretty well. 239 of us answered correctly as a class. I assume those of you who didn't were just having drag and drop issues. Um, anatomy is the study of structure. Physiology is the study of function. Let's talk about homeostasis and negative feedback. So that, this is one of the characteristics of life homeostasis. We need to maintain that relatively constant internal environment. And there's two kinds of feedback we use, negative and positive feedback. Negative feedback is going to maintain that homeostatic equilibrium. So when we think of negative feedback, we're going to have some kind of a set point in our body, like body temperature. And our body temperature can be a little bit above or a little bit below the set point. If we get too hot, we cool ourselves off. If we get too cold, we warm ourselves up. And this is an example of that dynamic equilibrium. We can have a little bit of a fluctuation, so there's a little bit of a change. It's dynamic around an equalized set point. Now, what makes negative feedback negative feedback? The response is opposite to the stimulus. When you feel cold, that's a stimulus, feeling cold, What's your response? You heat up. When you are hungry, when you have low blood sugar, that's the stimulus. The response is to eat something and raise your blood sugar. So these are examples of negative feedback. And there are lots and lots of examples of negative feedback in the human body. So as we look at these negative feedback examples that we'll talk about, um, these are just a couple of them. There is a negative or homeostasis worksheet available online. That's totally optional for you to do. I believe I have the answer key posted as well. For those of you who want to do those optional worksheets, print them off, do them on your own. When you're done filling them out, check the answer key that I posted to see if you're getting it right. If we lose homeostasis, we have disease or death. Loss of homeostatic equilibrium is also known as disease or illness. Now, as we're looking at homeostasis, we need something to pick up the signal, something to pick up that information. And that is going to be the receptor. Usually the receptor is something, some kind of sensory organ associated with the nervous system. And then we need our integrating or control center. This is typically going to be the brain and or spinal cord. So we have a receptor that picks up the information. That information is then going to be sent to the brain. The brain will process the information, make a decision, and send a signal to the effector organ. This effector organ can change from situation to situation. If we're cold, we shiver. The effector organ is a muscle. If we're too hot, we start to sweat. The effector organ is a sweat gland. So depending on the situation, we can have a wide variety of different effector organs. Um, let's talk positive feedback here. As we look at positive feedback, these are 
when we typically will lose homeostasis. Negative feedback will maintain homeostasis. Positive feedback is the opposite. The response is the same as the signal. So I'm going to back up two slides here. When we have negative feedback, our response is opposite to the stimulus. So we go back to the set point. When we have positive feedback, the response is the same as the stimulus. So we amplify the signal. Um, for example, when a woman is giving birth, we have pre-labor or early labor where there's mild uterine contractions. Mild uterine contractions will trigger more of a hormone to be released in the body. That hormone causes more contractions, which causes more of the hormone to be released, which causes more contractions, which causes more hormone. So you get the idea here. It's, you just, it just spirals and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then usually at the end of the labor and delivery process, there's really strong, really powerful, really consistent, closely timed contractions in the woman's body. Another example of a positive feedback loop is blood clotting. Once you start blood clotting, that blood will clot very quickly. Because if you're bleeding, you want to plug that hole in your cardiovascular system pronto. Another example of a positive feedback loop is going to be um, having electrical signals moved around in our nervous system. And these electrical signals can be amplified as they jump from neuron to neuron. So as we look at these positive feedback loops, what are some big picture ideas I want you to get out of them, out of this idea? First of all, it amplifies the signal. Positive feedbacks are also rare. Most feedback loops in the body overwhelmingly are going to be negative feedback loops. Let's talk about moving stuff in our body. To move stuff around in our bodies, we are going to have concentration gradients. And it can be a chemical gradient, it can be a temperature gradient, a pressure gradient. Whatever it is we're talking about with this gradient, the general pattern is, is that things will go with the gradient. They'll go from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, an area of high sugar concentration to an area of low sugar concentration. So the general pattern is, is we go from high to low, where we are moving with a gradient. And this is a spontaneous process that just occurs in our bodies based off of entropy. So when we go with the gradient, um, it is going to be a natural process. So this down gradient process happens spontaneously and does not require the input of energy. No energy is required to move with a concentration gradient. You know, going downhill in a wagon is easy. It's the uphill part. So this time of year we'll say a sled instead of a wagon. It's walking up the hill with your sled going against gravity, against the gradient, that's hard work. Um, and we are about out of time today, so I'm going to go ahead and call it quits just a smidge early. Um,